if you want to solve this issue, we need to stop addressing the symptoms. We need to stop addressing the hatred. Stop addressing the fear. Go to the source and fix the source. Address the ignorance. If you get rid of the ignorance, then there's nothing to fear because you know it. You fear what you're ignorant of, mm -hmm. okay? You fix the ignorance, there won't be any fear. If there's no fear, there's nothing to hate. If there's nothing to hate, then there's nothing to destroy. So go to the source, fix the ignorance, and you fix ignorance with education. Sincere thanks. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. On behalf of everybody that is here at the Center for Leadership Studies for you know spending time with us. As I think you know, we do leadership training here. So, right. so much of what we talk about is gonna be kind of focused in that realm. But I was certainly intrigued when we met for the first time about you know two hours ago about some of the things that you do internationally, your travels and some of the various places that you go to bring your message. So if you wouldn't mind starting there and just say, when you travel outside of our borders to talk with people, who are you talking to? What are you talking about? That sort of thing. Well, basically, I talk a lot about conflict resolution. And in particular here domestically, uh, my expertise is in race relations. And many of the countries you know, which I visit to give some of these lectures, they have their own issues. Like, for example, I was in India uh, recently, and they have uh, what they call the caste system there. While it's not quite the same as what we have here, there are some similarities. But in terms of conflict resolution, the principles are still the same and bringing opposite parties to the same table to have a conversation rather than avoid each other and solve nothing. Mm -hmm. um, before India, a few weeks before India, in fact, I was in Israel. The conflict there is between the Palestinians and the Jews. And I visited Palestinian groups, I, vis I visited Jewish groups, and I even visited a university where Palestinians, Jews, and Muslims all go to college together. So that was pretty fascinating. Oh, yeah. Is there a difference the way your message is perceived internationally than domestically? Is there um, anything that you, you can in, point to or, you know? Well, in some cases, internationally, some people are familiar with uh, white supremacy here in our country. Some have heard the name Ku Klux Klan and know a little bit about it. Others, they've only heard it remotely and not really quite sure what, you know, what they're all about because they're so invested in their own issues. Mm -hmm. But the principles are still the same. Okay. In my understanding from our very brief conversation is that if there is a, a, a typical consumer for your talk, your discussion, your dialogue, it has a lot to do with kids that are growing up. There's schools, there's churches, there's colleges. Is that fair? Is that the majority of where you um, head to spread your message? The majority of venues in which I speak I would say the vast majority are colleges and universities. Okay. But I do a number of high schools, middle schools, churches, synagogues, also civic organizations, and also corporations. A lot of corporations have time for diversity training or things like that. They'll bring in people like myself to present. Mm -hmm. And uh, police departments. From all of that, the vast diversity or the spectrum of people that, that hear your message um, for, for a variety of different reasons, do you get any more resistance from one audience versus another? Like if you think about the times you've been telling your story and people were uh, resistant to it, is there any sort of similarity, if you well, will? Well, sure. You know, anytime you pioneer something, yeah. you're one of the first to get off the track of the status quo. You're always going to have your share of detractors. So I have my share, even some you know, people who look like me. Mm -hmm. quite understand why I would sit down and talk with a white supremacist. That's just unheard of. You know, you're, you're catering to the enemy. Why would you even sit down with them? And then there are people who look like you, who think the same thing yeah. about me. But until they see it work, they have the aha moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. Now I see what he's doing. Yeah, see where you're going with that, mm -hmm. okay. In terms of like investment in youth, let's say, like so some of the programs that you're doing at 
high schools, colleges. Do you find that that age group in particular is really receptive to, to what you have to say versus maybe, again, people that look like me, sort of baby boomer, generational, you know, kind of things. Like we're, we're more set in our ways potentially and there's, there's, you know, we've lived a lot of years living a certain way. Is there any generational receptivity to your message? Generationally, there are a lot of disconnects. Mm -hmm. You know, when I speak to a lot of younger people, many of them, you know, I think the, the KKK, you know, that's something, you know, they heard about in their grandparents' age. Yeah. You know, is, is it still around? You know, that kind of thing. Powerful message, powerful challenge, powerful issue. But it really seems like the uniqueness of your response to that is the manner in which you approach it. It seems to me, outside looking in, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's, you know what you gotta do is you gotta understand that. You need to invest to understand where that is coming from and what's driving it, as opposed to just openly, you know, resisting it. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Of Absolutely, and to take it a step further, anytime, you know, you're gonna deal with opposition uh, or something that is not equitable, or even, it may be right, you know, you, you go to a foreign country, they're not wrong, they're just culturally different than we are. Mm -hmm. And we cannot leave our country and go to uh, a country, say in Europe or in Africa or Asia, and expect everybody over there to behave and do things the same way we do. Mm -hmm. That's their culture, we respect it. When they come, they respect our culture. But it's important that we learn as much as we can about the other person before going there. So A, we don't embarrass ourselves and make us look stupid or make our country look stupid. So now, convey that to what I do with white supremacists, black supremacists, neo-Nazis, uh, KKK members and things like that. I have studied up on these people. Oftentimes, I know as much, if not more, about them and their organizations than they do. I've even had Klansmen call me up and ask me questions because they didn't know the answer <laughs> about the Klan. Yeah. So while they may not like me, they respect me for my knowledge. You have to take a leadership role if you're going to try to persuade somebody or set an example that is influential. We only have one chance to make a good first impression. We may have a second or third chance to make a good impression, but one chance to make a good first impression. And most people will judge you on their first impression. And when you're trying to cultivate a relationship with someone, it usually takes more than one meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like as you describe what you do, you almost, you're asking yourself like, why don't more people do this? People that are really interested in solving some of the very sincere challenges that we have in the world, and it sounds like from your travels, it's not just confined to, you know, to our country, obviously, it's all over the place. Uh, your childhood and the ability to grow up, as I understand it, in different cultures and appreciate different cultures at a very early age, how did that help prepare you for uh, what you eventually have become? Indeed, it did prepare me, and unbeknownst to me, Every time you go somewhere and see something different, it's in you, you know, it's always there. And oftentimes you take it for granted. Now, my parents were US Foreign Service. So I grew up as an American embassy brat. You get assigned to a country for two years. You come back home here to the States. You're here for a few months, maybe even a year. And then you get reassigned to another country abroad. And back and forth, back and forth every two years. Today, I'm a professional musician. So I play all over this country. I play all over the world. Between traveling with my folks as a kid and traveling now as an adult professional musician, as of last week, I've now been in a total of 56 different countries on, uh, on six continents. I've played in 49 of the 50 states, I've played or lectured. So I've been exposed to a multitude of cultures, ethnicities, colors, nationalities, religions, etc. And all of that has helped shape who I've become. Now, when I was a kid, you know, naturally, whatever we do, we think all kids do. You know, that's all we know. Mm -hmm. And when I was overseas, the kids that I would play with, 
uh, other than the natives of the countries you know, in which we were, in Europe or in Africa or whatever, the embassy kids, we all did the same thing. Because all our parents traveled, and you know, that was their job. So that was a norm. I appreciated all the things that I saw and did, but not as much until I would come back home and I would be in class here in the States, in geography class or history class, and we would be studying the Mona Lisa or the Eiffel Tower, the Berlin Wall, the pyramids, the Sphinx, the walkway in Damascus, Syria, where Jesus walked, things like that. Uh, I've been to all those places. I've touched the Berlin Wall. I've been in the Eiffel Tower. I stood as close as you and I are to the Mona Lisa, okay? I've been inside the Sphinx and the pyramids. So I realized then that most of the people sitting around my class here in the States, the closest they would ever get to those things were the pictures in the textbook. And I'd been to those things. So that really, really made me appreciative of the things that I, you know, that I'd been able to do. Uh, I remember a few times when I came back from Africa, um, kids my age, you know, back when I was young, the first thing they would ask me is, you know, did you see Tarzan? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got it because, you know, if I had lived here that long and never traveled, I'd probably be asking the same thing because that was their perception of Africa. You know, some guys swinging through the trees because that's all we saw on TV here, which is totally, you know, a made up thing. But uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time is by Mark Twain. And it's called Mark Twain's Travel Quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that's the God's honest truth, you know. I would like to think, if I had not had all those experiences, that I would still be the same person I am today, love everybody, try to get everybody to get along, etc. But in all honesty, would I? Probably not. I'd probably stay as far away from opposition as I could. You know, just do my own thing. One time when we came home from overseas, it was 1968 and I was age 10. And we moved to a place called Belmont, Massachusetts. Belmont is a suburb of Boston. It's right next door to Cambridge. In fact, I would ride my bicycle past Harvard University all the time. I was one of two black kids in the entire uh, elementary school. I was in fourth grade. It was a little black girl in second grade. Consequently, everybody else is white. And so all of my friends were white, fourth and fifth graders. And a lot of my guy friends were members of the uh, Cub Scouts. And they invited me to join. So it sounded like fun, you know, get to tie some knots and go camping. So I joined the Cub Scouts. And we had a, uh, a parade, a march, from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, which is also right, right next to Belmont, to uh, commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. And it was the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, Brownies, 4-H Club, and some other organizations. And the streets were blocked off. The sidewalks were lined up with nothing but white people. And they were all cheering and waving flags. And my den mother let me carry the American flag. And I'm marching with my fellow scouts, the only black scout in this whole thing. And somewhere down this parade route, as I was marching with my fellow scouts, I began getting hit with uh, bottles, soda pop cans, rocks, and debris from the street by just a small group of white spectators off to my right. And I remember there being a couple of kids and a couple of adults, maybe four, five, six total, no more than that. I assumed it was kids and their parents. And uh, I'd never had this happen before. And I was so naive, the first thing I thought was, oh, those people over there don't like the scouts, <laughs> you know? And I did not realize, truly did not realize that I was the only scout uh, getting hit until my den mother, my cub master, and, and all these troop leaders came rushing back to where I was, and they, they all were, were white, and they huddled over me with their bodies and protected me and escorted me out of the danger. Well, nobody else is getting this treatment. You know, what's happening with me? Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, well, why? why? Why are they hitting me? Why are they hitting me? 
And all they would say is, shh, move along, Daryl, move along, move along, it'll be okay, hurry up. And they never answered my question. So being age 10, you know, you have to have answers if you have questions. I began creating my own answers. I'm thinking, okay, maybe they're just testing me because I'm the new kid on the block. You know, I'd only been there, you know, a few months. And I had every excuse but the right excuse. When I got home, my mother and father, who were not at the parade, they were fixing me up with a mercurochrome, that sticky yep, red yep. stuff, and, and alcohol and Band-Aids. And they were asking me, you know, how did you fall down and get all scraped up? And I told them I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what happened. For the first time in my life, you know, I'm not stupid, but I'm naive. For the first time in my life, my parents sat me down and explained to me what racism was. Believe it or not, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. I had no idea what they were talking about. Because when I was overseas, mm -hmm. my classes were filled with kids from Nigeria, Italy, Germany, France, China, Japan, Russia. Anybody who had an embassy in those countries, all of their kids, we all went to the same international school. So if you were to peep your head in my classroom doorway, you would say, oh, that looks like a United Nations of little kids, because that's exactly what it was, <laughs> all right? The term that we use today to describe that scenario is uh, multicultural, but that term did not exist back in the mid 60s. So while I was being quote unquote multicultural, my peers back home here were either going to all white schools or um, black and white schools if integration had evolved in those towns, mm -hmm. okay? So when I would come back, I was either in an all black school or a black and white school, but not with the amount of diversity that we have today or that I had overseas. When I was overseas, I was literally living about 12 years ahead of my time because that scenario had yet to come here. All right, so I was accustomed to diversity. It was nothing new to me. I'm an only child. My parents got it right the first time. You know what? You're talking to another only child. All right. So you right, know back what I'm about. You. right back at you. You know what I'm talking about. That's right. Me. That's right. Your folks got it right, too. Yeah, yeah. All right. So Why move on? Why <laughs> move on? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my parents had never lied to me about anything. If I had a question or a problem, they either answered it or solved it or gave me the tools by which I could derive the answers or find the solution myself. They never lied to me. But on this day in 1968, when they told me why I was being targeted by these projectiles, I literally thought they were lying. I could, my 10-year-old mind could not get around the idea that someone who had never spoken to me, someone who had never um, seen me before, someone who knew absolutely nothing about me, would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than this the color of my skin. It made no sense. And those kids, and I guess their parents, whoever was on the sidewalk doing all this, did not look any different to me than my, my white friends overseas, whether they were my fellow Americans at the embassy or my little German or Swedish friends or whatever, Australian friends, or for that matter, my friends right here in Belmont, you know, or their parents who for the most part treated me, you know, rather well. So my parents had to be lying because people don't do things like that. <laughs> and I didn't believe them. Well, almost a month and a half later, on that, that same year, 1968, on April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And then all hell broke loose all over this country, as you recall. Oh, yeah. Right? Nearby Boston burned to the ground. My hometown, Chicago, Illinois, burned to the ground. Washington, D.C., New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Detroit, Los Angeles. Rioting, destruction, burning, all over skin color, race. Mm -hmm. So while I did not understand why people have such an issue with the color of someone's skin, it was then that I realized my parents had not lied to me, that there are certain people out there on both sides who have these issues. And then shortly thereafter, that fall, we moved back overseas on another assignment. And once again, I was around normalcy. Mm -hmm. People from all over getting along, okay? So I had formed a question in my mind at that age of 10. Question was, 
how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And for 50 years, I've been looking for the answer. Every time I come home, some incident would happen. And starting in my teenage years, and even through my adult years, I would buy every book I could find on black supremacy, on white supremacy, on anti-Semitism, on the Ku Klux Klan, on the Nazis in Germany, on the neo-Nazis over here. How does somebody acquire that ideology? I know you're not born with it. So where's it coming from? Where's it going? How can it be addressed? None of my books answered the question, how can you hate me when you don't know me? So after I graduated high school, I went to uh, Howard University where I got my degree and majored in music. So music became my profession, but studying race relations became my obsession. And that's what I did on my own. And so I graduated in 1980 with my degree in music and started playing full time, which is what I, I do for a living now. In 1983, country music had made a resurgence. There had been a movie out called Urban Cowboy, with John Travolta, <laughs> Mechanical Bull, and all these line dances. <laughs> so a lot of the bars and clubs, you know, that had live bands, they flipped from top 40 to country. And so, you know, if you want to work as a full-time musician, you join the country band, because that was what was happening. So I joined this country band, and uh, I was the only black guy in the band. I like country music, you know, it's, it's easy to play. It's, <laughs> let me tell you something, man. Country and blues, they're kissing cousins. It's the same music, okay? Hank Williams Sr., the father of country music, to me he's a blues singer, because he sings from the soul, he sings from the heart, from the gut. Yeah. Yeah, he feels what he sings. He said he learned to play guitar from a black street blues guitar player, a guy named Rufus T-Top Payne, <laughs> okay? And T-Top would sit on the street with his guitar case open playing blues. And people walk by and throw quarters in his case down on the streets of Montgomery, Alabama, which is where Hank Williams was from. Okay? And Hank would go there and he became friends with T-Top in exchange for sandwiches, which Hank would give T-Top Payne, T-Top would give Hank guitar lessons. And if you listen to your cheating heart, you win again, and all these great uh, country songs that Hank Williams wrote, th that's the blues. Move it on over, that is the blues, okay? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I joined this country band, and the band was already established. I was the new member. We uh, go back up to Frederick, Maryland. You know, Frederick was a stronghold for the Klan. And we're playing at a bar called the Silver Dollar Lounge. And the Silver Dollar Lounge was an all-white bar. And when I say all-white in this particular case, I don't mean that uh, black people could not go in there. What I mean is that black people did not go in there. Mm -hmm. And that was by their own choice. And it was a good choice because they were not welcome. Well, here I was at the Silver Dollar Lounge. And after we finished the first set, we came off the bandstand and I'm following you know, the bandmates over to this table across the dance floor to go sit down on break. And a white gentleman came up behind me, maybe in his mid to late 40s, and he put his arm around my shoulder. Now, I couldn't see him, but I see all my band people over here, and I don't know anybody in this club, so I'm gonna <laughs> turn around, and who's touching me? Yeah. And he says, man, I really like your all's music. I said, thank you, and I shook his hand. And then he points at the bandstand and says, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I explained to the guy, look, I just joined this band. You know, I said, but yes, you probably did see them before because they told me they had played here before but this is my first time. He was well, man, I sure like your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was not offended, but I was rather taken aback, surprised, shocked that he did not know, as old as he was, he did not know the origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's style of piano playing. And I said, um, well, he learned it from the same place I did, from black blues and boogie woogie piano players. He goes, Nah, Jerry Lee ain't never learned anything from black people. I ain't <laughs> never heard no black man play piano like that, except for you. So I'm thinking, okay, this guy never saw Little Richard or Fats Domino, right? And I went on to explain to the guy, look, man, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis is a very good friend of mine. He's told me himself where he learned how to play. The guy did not buy that I knew Jerry Lee. He did not buy that Jerry Lee learned anything from black people, but he was fascinated with me and he wanted to buy me a drink. Now, I don't drink, but I went back to his table and I had a cranberry juice. He calls the waitress over, she brings my cranberry juice, he pays her, he takes his glass and he clinks my glass and cheers me. And then he says, you know, 
This is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm thinking, you know, what is going on here? <laughs> I was 25 at the time. And in my 25 years on the face of this earth, I had sat down with thousands of white people or anybody else and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. And this guy was probably in his 40s. He's never sat down with a black guy before. Again, I was naive because of my experiences. Had I grown up here, it might have explained it, you know? So anyway, I innocently asked him, I said, why? And he didn't answer me. He looked at the, at the tabletop and I asked him again. He had a friend sitting next to him. His friend said, tell him, tell him, tell him, man, tell him. I said, tell me, you know, what's this, what's this big secret? He looked back at me and he said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I burst out laughing at him, because now I do not believe him. I have every book written on the Klan, and I've read them all. And in none of my books does it talk about how a Klansman will come up and embrace a black guy and praise him for whatever you know, he's doing and want to hang out and buy him a drink. It doesn't work that way. So I thought the guy was pulling my leg. I'm laughing. He goes inside his wallet, hands me his Klan membership card, I take this down, I'm looking at, I recognize the Ku Klux Klan insignia, which is this red circle with a white cross and red blood drop in the center. And I stop laughing, because I realize this thing is for real. So I give it back to him. And we talked about the Klan and some other things. And he gave me his phone number. And he wanted me to call him any time I was to come back to this bar with this band because he wanted to bring his friends, you know, his Klan friends, to, <laughs> <laughs> to see this black guy. I'm not sure he called me a black guy to his friends, but to see this black guy uh, play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I said, okay, I'll call you. We were there every six weeks on a rotation with other bands. And um, I'd call him on a Wednesday or a Thursday and say, hey man, we're gonna be at the Silver Dollar Lounge, come on out. He'd come. He would bring Klansmen and Klanswomen to the show and they would gather around near the stage and watch me play with the band. And then they'd get out there and dance to our music. You know, they didn't come in robes and hoods, right? They came in regular clothing. Yeah. And uh, on the break, sometimes I would go over to his table to say hello. And some of the clan members, clansmen and clanswomen, would hang there. You know, they were curious about me and want to meet me and talk to me. Others, when they saw me coming, they'd get up and take off and go stand somewhere afar. Just kind of like watch me from a distance. They want nothing to do with me, which is fine. So, you know, this went on until the end of 83. And I quit that band and I went back in 84 playing rock and roll and blues and R&B and whatever else was happening in 84. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, Daryl, that was a perfect opportunity to get the answer to your question that you've been looking for since age 10. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Who better to ask? than someone who would join an organization that has a whole history of hating people who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. Get back in contact with that guy and get him to fix you up with the leader of the Klan, you know, from Maryland or whatever, start with him, and sit him down and interview him and ask him, look, man, you don't even know me. How can you hate me? All right? And then travel up north, travel down south, go to the Midwest, go to the West, and interview all kinds of different clan people, and you'll have a book. That was my idea. There had been no book written on the Ku Klux Klan before mine by a black author. Mine was the first. There had been two books written uh, by black authors that dealt with the Klan, but each one talked about how he escaped a lynching, one in the 1930s and one in the 1940s, but not from the perspective of sitting down face to face interviewing there would be lynchers, right? Mm -hmm. All the other books were written by white authors. Obviously, you know, they had easier access to sit down without ramification and interview somebody like that. Or they could join the Klan undercover, get the story, get out and write about it. Or an ex-Klansman, ex-Klanswoman, you know, writing their memoirs. So I want to sit down face to face. Now, let me give you the hierarchy of the Ku Klux Klan. Today, there is no such thing as the Ku Klux Klan. There used to be the Ku Klux Klan, one Klan group and chapters of that one Klan group. Today, it's all dissipated. There are all these splinter groups, different Ku Klux Klan groups. They all are autonomous. They all use the name Ku Klux Klan. You might have the Dixie Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, 
the Invisible Empire Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, on and on and on. These are all separate autonomous clan groups. Uh, they use the same colors on their robes that designate their rank. They all use the same secret handshake, the same titles, and basically the same bylaws. Everything is the same, uh, pretty much, except they're not centralized anymore. Mm -hmm. So you might even have several clan groups within the same state. Okay, now, if you have a clan group in your state, and you have a chapter of your particular clan group in another state, or in multiple states, you may then consider yourself to be a national clan group. Therefore, you have to have a national leader who oversees all the states in which you have a chapter. We call our national leader the president. They call theirs the imperial wizard. Anybody who is prefixed with the term imperial means that person is a national officer. So imperial wizard would be the top guy, the president. An imperial caliph would be like a vice president. And then you have secretaries and treasurers and on down the line. Then you have to have a state leader uh, in each state in which you have a chapter. We call our state leader the governor. They call theirs the grand dragon. Anybody who is prefixed with the word grand means that individual is on the state level, a state officer. So this guy named Roger Kelly was the grand dragon for the state of Maryland. And um, I wanted to meet him. I was going to make him my first interview. So uh, I hadn't seen this Klansman in a while because, you know, I, I left the band. And, you know, it wasn't like I had a day off and I'd go to Frederick and, and hang out with, with the Klan. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I found his number and I called it. It had been disconnected. So I had to track him down. It turns out he moved. But he, and he didn't have a phone. But he had an address. So I went by his apartment one evening. And there was no way for, for me to let him know I was coming because he had no phone. And so at about 7.30 in the evening, I knocked on his door. And he opens the door and he sees me. He goes, Daryl, what, you know, what are you doing here? And he steps out into the hallway. He looks up and down the hallway to see if I brought anybody with me. Well, when he stepped out into the hallway, I stepped into his apartment. He, come, he, turns around, he comes back in. He goes, what's going on, man? Are you still playing? What's going on? I said, yeah, yeah, man, I, listen, I'm still playing, but I need to talk to you about the Klan. He says, the Klan? And I said, yeah. I said, you're still in the Klan, right? He goes, no, actually, Daryl, I left the Klan. And he gave me some long dissertation as to why he left the Klan. And I said, well, where's all your Klan stuff? He says, you mean my Robin Hood? I said, yeah. He goes, well, they came and got it. And I said, what do you mean they came and got it? Don't you own your Robin Hood? And then he went on to explain to me, which I later found out to be true, that when you join the Klan, if you can afford it, you purchase the Robin Hood, the bylaws book and handbook and different things, and you take them home with you and they're, they're yours to keep. If you cannot afford these items, you still take them home with you, um, but you put in a little extra money every dues period until it's paid off. Well, apparently he hadn't paid it off, so they came and repoed his Robin Hood. And he told me that when they came to get it, he could not find the mask that covered the face that attaches to the hood but he had since found it and he needed to return it. I said, uh, let me see it. And he went down this hallway that was behind us and he returns and hands me this mask. And I'm looking at it. And I said, listen, man, do you know Roger Kelly? Yeah, I know Roger. Roger was my grand dragon. I said, well, listen, <laughs> I'm writing a book on the Klan. I need you to hook me up with Mr. Kelly. I want to interview him. Oh, Daryl, I can't do that. Why not? Oh man, I'll get in trouble. We'll get in trouble. I said, but you're not in the Klan anymore, you said. It doesn't matter. I cannot take a black man to the Grand Dragon. I said, I'll tell you what. You need to return this, this mask, right? He goes, yeah. I said, give me Roger Kelly's address and phone number, and I'll go to his house. I'll return it for you. He said, snatched that thing right out of my hand. He said, no way. I begged and pleaded with this guy to give me the uh, address and phone number. Finally, after about 20 minutes of my begging, he gave it to me on the condition that I not revealed to Mr. Kelly where I got his personal information. I said, okay. And then this guy warned me. He said, Daryl, do not go to Roger Kelly's house. Roger Kelly will kill you. I called my secretary, Mary, and I give her Roger Kelly's phone number. I said, listen, you know, give him a call around five o'clock, people get off work, and I tell him you know, that you're working for somebody who's writing a book on the Klan. Would he consent to sitting down with me and giving me an interview? I said, but do not tell Mr. Kelly that I'm black. 
I said, if he asks, don't lie to him. But don't allude to it. Don't give him reason to ask. She said, okay. I did not want to call him because I figured, you know, if I call him, he might pick up in my voice that I'm black mm -hmm. and say, I'm not talking to you. Click. And then my whole project would have ended before it ever got started. I figured if she called him, he would know by her voice that she's white. And he would not automatically assume that this white woman is working for a black man, especially a black man who's writing a book on the Klan because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. She got a hold of him and he agreed to do the interview. He didn't ask what color I was. Well, we set it up for a Sunday evening at 5.15 in the motel right above the Silver Dollar Lounge. Now he had actually invited us over to his house to do this interview, not knowing that I was black, all right? But said, this just set it up for a motel room, you know, kind of, you know neutral territory. So 5.15 on Sunday afternoon, and uh, Mary and I got to the room several hours earlier. And then I sent Mary down the hallway with some money to get soda pop out of the machine, put it in the ice bucket, fill it with ice, get it all cold, so I could be at least hospitable to my guest if he stayed. I had no idea what he was going to do. But if he was going to stay and be interviewed, I wanted to offer him a cold beverage. Now, the way the room just happened to be, if you're standing in the hallway of this motel and the doorway is here, you have to come through the door, turn to your right, and the room is back here where mm -hmm. you cannot see who's in the room if you're standing in the hallway. Come in, turn the corner, then you see. There was a lamp table. I took the lamp off, put the table over here in the most obscure corner of the room. I put a chair on one side of the table for Mr. Kelly, a chair on this side for me, and I had like a, like a duffel bag beside me. In my bag, I had a copy of the Bible because the Ku Klux Klan claims to be a Christian organization. And they claim that the Bible preaches racial separation. Now, in my reading of the Bible, I've never seen it. So I want to be able to pull out my Bible and say, here, Mr. Kelly, show me chapter and verse where it says blacks and whites must be separate. So I had that there. I had a cassette player. I set it in the middle of the table, all in hopes that he would come in the room and allow me to interview him and record. And then I had some blank cassettes in my bag. So I'm all set. Right on time, I'm seated back there where you can't see me. Mary hops up, runs around the corner, opens the door. In walks what is known as the Grand Nighthawk. Nighthawk in clan uh, language means bodyguard, security. So a Grand Nighthawk is the bodyguard to the Grand Dragon. Like an Imperial Nighthawk would be the bodyguard to the Imperial Wizard. So this Grand Nighthawk walks in. He's wearing military camouflage. And right here he has the uh, Ku Klux Klan emblem, that red circle, white cross, blood drop. Over here are the initials KKK. And embroidered on his barrette is uh, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And right here he has a semi-automatic handgun and a holster. He comes in and Mr. Kelly is walking <laughs> right behind him in a dark blue suit and tie. And the Nighthawk turned and saw me sitting there and just froze, <laughs> you know? And Mr. Kelly did not realize that his Nighthawk had stopped short. And he slammed into his back <laughs> and knocked him forward. And so then, you know, they're stumbling around trying to, you know, regain their balance. And they're like looking all around the room, like, uh-uh, something's not right here. I'm just sitting there, you know, looking at their faces. And I, I see the apprehension. I realized, I, I knew what they were thinking. They were thinking one of two things. They were thinking the desk clerk gave them the wrong room number, uh, or they misunderstood it, or this is a setup, this is an ambush. So I stood up and I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward. I said, hi, Mr. Kelly, I'm Daryl Davis. He shook my hand. The Nighthawk shook my hand. I said, come on in, have a seat, have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down. So far, so good. The Nighthawk stood at attention to his right. And before I could sit down opposite him, Mr. Kelly says, Mr. Davis, do you have any form of identification? I said, sure. I gave him my driver's license. He goes, oh, you live on such and such street in Silver Spring. Now that had me a little concerned. You know, why is yeah. he looking at my street address? Is he gonna come by my house and burn a cross or what? Um, all he has to do is look at my picture, look at my name, look at me, make sure it matches and then give me back my license. Here he goes, you know, reading my address. 
So I did not want to let him know that I was a little concerned. But I wanted to let him know in no uncertain terms, you know, don't get any ideas of coming to my house and doing anything nefarious. So I said to him, I said, look, yes, Mr. Kelly, that is where I live. I said, and you live at, and I named his house number and his street. That way I was leveling the playing field. I was letting him know, you know where I live, I know where you live. So if you come visit me, <laughs> I might come visit you. So we're gonna confine all this visiting to this motel room. So yeah, he smiled, he nodded his head, he understood the implication. And I did not realize it that day, but I had been presumptuous. Uh, I found out many, many months later that one of his clan members lived right down the road from my house. I didn't know that. And if Mr. Kelly were to go to this guy's house, he had to go down my street. So he recognized the street name. It was pure coincidence, but there's no way I could have known that at the time. Anyway, we got on with this interview. Within a few minutes, Mr. Kelly let me know that I am inferior, that black people are inferior to white people. Black people have smaller brains than white people. Uh, we are prone to criminal activity. We're lazy, we don't like to work. We take advantage of the government welfare system. You know, every stereotype you can imagine, I heard. And I wasn't there to fight with him. I was there to listen and learn from him. Because I'm asking him, you know, why do you hate me? You don't even know me. Now, obviously, he doesn't even know me because, A, I don't have a criminal record. I work, and I've never been on welfare. So, obviously, he's not talking about me, <laughs> you know. And, yes, sure, there are black people who fit that stereotype. But I can find white people who fit it, too, <laughs> you know. So, I'm just listening and, you know, trying to understand where he's coming from. And any time he would say, well, Mr. Davis, the Bible says, I'd reach down and pull out my Bible to give to him. Uh, or if my cassette ran out of tape, I'd reach down and get a fresh cassette. Every time I reached like this, the bodyguard, the Nighthawk, would reach like this. And after a while, he realized there was no threat in the bag. And I went in and out of the bag, no problem. A little over an hour into this uh, interview, I heard a strange noise in the room. It was a very quick noise, like a quack. And we all jumped. And I knew that, that Mr. Kelly had made the noise. I knew this because I didn't make it. So if I didn't make it, he had to have made it. And I flew up out of my chair, hit the table, because I was going to dive across the table and grab the Nighthawk and grab Mr. Kelly and slam them both down to the ground and take away the Nighthawk's gun. I had gone into what you call survival mode. I feared for my life. My mind was racing at 100 miles an hour trying to figure out what did I just say? What did I just do to cause Mr. Kelly to make some weird noise? And I could hear that former Klansman's voice in my head, Daryl, do not fool with Roger Kelly. He will kill you. And I didn't want to die that day. And because I could not discern the noise, I perceived it to be ominous. I perceived it to be threatening. So I'd gone in, into survival mode because I feared for my life. And you know, when you fear for your life and you go into survival mode, people will do one of four things. Some people, depending upon the level of fear, they'll just faint. It's just too much and they pass out. Other people will just tense up and start shaking like this. And you can be hitting them, punching them, whatever. They won't even be blocking the blows. They'll just be like this. And that's called paralysis by fear. Their muscles lock up. They're so scared they can't move. Their nerves are shot. The third thing people will do is they will run away. And that is the best option. And that is the option that I would have chosen if it was available to me. You know, to put as much distance between yourself and the source of your fear as quickly as possible. You cannot outrun a bullet in a motel room. So that was not available. The last and final option you have is to do what you call a preemptive strike. Get them before they get you. So I was gonna take them down. And I hit the table and my eyes were looking right into him and my eyes locked with his eyes. I didn't say a word because I knew that my eyes were speaking loud and clear. In fact, my eyes were shouting so loud he could hear my eyes. And my eyes were saying to him, what did you just do? His eyes had fixated on my eyes. He didn't say a word either, but I could read his eyes like telepathy. His eyes were saying to me, what did you just do? And the Nighthawk had his hand on his gun looking back and forth between both of us. His eyes were saying, what did either one of y'all just do? <laughs> well, 
Mary was sitting to my left on top of the dresser because there were no more chairs. And she realized what had happened and she was explaining it to us when it happened again. <laughs> the ice in the ice bucket next to her had begun melting and the can shifted and fell down the ice. And that's what made the noise. And we all began laughing at how ignorant we all had been. This was a teaching moment. I won't say that it was a learning moment, but it was a teaching moment. And the lesson taught is this, all because some foreign, an underscore, circle, highlight the word foreign, entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice and cans of soda, entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, unbeknownst to us, we became fearful and accusatory of each other. The lesson taught is this, ignorance breeds fear. We fear those things we don't understand. If you do not put a cap on that fear, that fear in turn will escalate to hatred because we hate those things that frighten us. If you don't cap that hatred, that will escalate to destruction because we want to destroy those things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? They may have been harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost unravel to completion, the last component being destruction. Had the Nighthawk put out his gun and shot somebody, namely me or my secretary, because it was his job to protect himself and his boss. Or had I pounced across the table and hurt one of them, because it's my job to protect myself and my secretary. So it stopped just short of that. Now, we did see that exact thing that I'm talking about take place in Charlottesville, Virginia, where there was plenty of ignorance, plenty of fear, plenty of hatred. And what did it culminate in? Destruction, when a white supremacist got into a car and tried to murder as many people as he could by driving through the crowd of protesters. He ended up injuring 20 and murdering one girl, Heather Heyer. Ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. If you wanna solve this issue, we need to stop addressing the symptoms. We need to stop addressing the hatred, stop addressing the fear, go to the source and fix the source. Address the ignorance. If you get rid of the ignorance, then there's nothing to fear because you know it. You fear what you're ignorant of, mm -hmm. okay? You fix the ignorance, there won't be any fear. If there's no fear, there's nothing to hate. If there's nothing to hate, then there's nothing to destroy. So go to the source, fix the ignorance, and you fix ignorance with education. You bring enlightenment and you alleviate the ignorance. All right, so anyway, we went on with this interview. There were no more problems. It kept making the noise. We laughed and carried on. At the end, I thanked Mr. Kelly. And we shook hands, he wished me well. And he gave me his clan card and told me to stay in touch. And I'm thinking to myself, what? I didn't come here to make friends with the clan. I came here <laughs> to find out how can you hate me when you don't know me. But I was polite. I said, okay, Mr. Kelly, I said, I have other clan people to interview you know, um, but I will call you when my book is ready for publication. He said, okay, shook my hand, wished me luck, and off they went. And Mary and I packed up, headed back down the road, and in my car I said to her, I said, you know, I rather like Roger Kelly. Her head almost hit the ceiling of my car. She goes, what? You know, he doesn't like you. You know, what do you like about him? And I said, well, I don't like what he stands for, but I like him as a person. We have more in common than we do in contrast. Most of what we have in contrast is how we each feel about race. He feels he is superior to me. I feel I am equal to him. He feels we have to be apart. I feel we can be together. But on other matters, we agree on a lot of stuff, except when it comes to racial matters. So I say, you know what? I am gonna stay in contact with him. And I would stay in contact with him. I interviewed people all over the country. Some would talk to me, 
Some would not talk to me. Some wanted to fight me as soon as they saw me. Those who would talk to me, I would stay in contact with. So I would invite Roger Kelly down to my house. He'd come down to my house with his Nighthawk. <laughs> and we would talk. And uh, we would even eat you know, lunch or dinner at my dining room table. Now, here's a man who thought I was inferior. All right? But yet he's in my inferior house, sitting at my inferior dining room table, eating my inferior food, right? And I know this was his first time doing that. Not my first time. Like I said, I sat down with thousands of white people and anybody else and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation, sort of like that guy in the Silver Dollar. He never had a drink with a black man before. So that was planting a seed. I would invite over some of my Jewish friends, some of my other white friends, some of my black friends, just to engage in conversation with this guy so that he would not think, oh, well, Daryl Davis is an exception. No, I'm not an exception. <laughs> maybe you need to talk to other people. You know, maybe you're the exception for how you believe. Yeah. You know? And so this went on for a while. It went on for two years. And by the end of two years, he was coming to my house by himself. No Nighthawk. And he trusted me that much. But he never invited me to his house. All right? After a couple years, he got promoted from Grand Dragon, state leader, to Imperial Wizard, national leader. He began inviting me to his house. And I go to his house, I see his clan den, where he'd have his meetings, take some pictures, take some more notes from my book. And then he began inviting me to clan rallies. And I would go to these clan rallies, and I would stand around and watch the ceremony or whatever. You see all these clansmen and clanswomen in their robes and hoods, they have a big, wide circle around this 20 to 30 foot high wooden cross. Two wooden beams tied together with rope. And the cross has been wrapped, the wood has been wrapped in burlap. And the burlap has been soaked in what they call clan cologne, which is actually diesel fuel, kerosene. And they have these torches. And they parade around the cross in a circle. And then one of the leaders, Grand Dragon or Imperial Wizard, will you know, bark out orders. Clansmen halt, and they all stop. And then he'll say, for my God, and they all repeat, for my God, for my country, for my country, for my clan, for my clan, white power, white power, and they bow and so on. Clansmen approach the cross, and they all, as I say, this is the cross, they all come into the base of the cross. Clansmen light the cross, and they drop their torches at the foot of the cross, and whoosh, this thing goes on fire, the kerosene diesel fuel this big flaming cross, and they stand around, they admire this thing, and then they give some speeches, and then that's the end of the rally. So I saw a bunch of these, and of course I'm traveling around the country, and I, I got to go to other people's clan rallies too, not everybody's, but different ones. Over time, Mr. Kelly began questioning his own ideology um, through our conversations. And one day he left the clan. He called me and wrote me a letter saying, saying that he was sorry for anything that he had done that ever offended me. You know, he left the clan, and he gave me his robe and hood. I now, I now own that. I have a bunch of those things over time, you know, but he no longer believes in that ideology anymore. I won't say I converted him, but I was the impetus for his conversion. He converted himself, but it came through conversation, just talking you know, listening to one another. I think in this country, we spend too much time talking about the other person, or talking at the other person, or talking past the other person. What I prefer to do is sit down and talk with the other person. And I have this theory that when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. They might be yelling and screaming and beating their fists on the table, to make a point, but at least they're talking. They're not fighting. It's when the talking ceases, when the conversation ceases, that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So we want to keep the conversation going. If you spend five minutes with your worst enemy, you will find something in common. If you spend 10 minutes, you'll find even more. And if you begin to nurture those commonalities, you're building a relationship. If you nurture that relationship, you're building a friendship. How can you sit down with somebody face to face? 
like we're doing right now. And the person speaks the same language you do. That person wants the same things for his or her family that you want for yours. How can you hate them? So they're looking at them and learning all this about them. It's, it's a little harder, you know? Mm -hmm. So as you nurture that relationship, you're building a friendship. And then all of those things that you had, you find even more commonalities. And all of those things that you had in contrast, like which church you went to or synagogue or what pigmentation you have, begin to matter less and less. And that's what happened. And he left the organization. Something that uh, luckily stuck in my mind as you were going through probably the most amazing story I've ever heard live. When you got an invitation to come to a Klan rally, gotta believe that's fairly unique. Even more unique, I got an invitation last year, and I got one this year as well, to come speak to a Klan meeting. <laughs> yeah, I this is like, uh, okay, so I'm Tennessee. on camera freaking out here. It's just wild to me that you would be there uh, and observe this, just really this kind of this tribute to hatred, I guess. What's going through your head? What are you thinking? Are people talking to you? Uh, how are they reacting to you in that setting? Which to me, the whole motivation for that ritual has something to do with you in a very negative way. I mean, mm -hmm. just that dynamic, if you right. wouldn't mind spending a minute there. like Okay, well, Here's the thing, you are a rational person. So it's in your nature to seek rationale. And you're looking for rationale behind a black man being invited to a Klan rally where they light up crosses on fire, which is reminiscent of, of terror. And, yeah. and reminder of bombing black churches and dragging people behind vehicles and hanging them from trees, etc. Yes, absolutely, all that baggage is there. Okay, and that is reminiscent of that. Um, but what you have to understand is this. Being a racist is irrational. It is irrational to hate someone because of the color of their skin. So you're looking for rationale where there is none. So if they're going to be irrational by joining these groups, they're also going to do other irrational stuff, like invite me to their rally. Yeah. Because they're irrational people, okay? But I'm glad that they invite me. Sure. I haven't had too much problem. Now, there are those who do not like me being there. And, sure. they, get, and they get upset. But there is a chain of command. If the Grand Dragon or Imperial Wizard says, hands off, you leave him alone, you know, you don't yeah. go and against. It's rational to me if you grow up in an environment that teaches and supports hate, mm -hmm. it's rational that you would hate. Right. Okay. In your mind, yeah. It, yeah, it's like this is my world and right. this is what I've been exposed to and all of those sorts of things. It seems to me the thing that is um, unique about you and it's fundamentally at your, your message about leadership is you had a pretty unique first 10 years. You couldn't make sense of, you know, parents and kids throwing stuff at you in Boston when you were 10 carrying the American flag. That was weird to you. Right. So to me, it seems your message to leaders today, mm -hmm. political leaders, leaders in organizations, whatever, it's investigate, find out, mm -hmm. challenge your own beliefs, get out there. If you feel weird, <laughs> you know, about somebody or something, whatever it is, for whatever reason, lead, act on that, do something about it. Don't just sit here with your beliefs and, and, and sort of make enemies. Is that fair? Yeah, it is a fair, and I, and I take it a few steps further. You know, our society is only going to become, it only can become one of two things. It can become what we let it become, or second, it can become what we make it. What do, what do we do about that? We like to end things because we're training people with, you know, application challenges. Or sure. What. So what do we do tomorrow, next week, next month, whatever, okay. to sort of take a grassroots step in that? I call it crossing the cafeteria. And let me explain that to you. In a lot of uh, metropolitan cities, perhaps Raleigh-Durham, you have these companies, let's say, where people are working on a project together of all different backgrounds. 
they might even be sharing the same cubicle. And they get along, they work fine together. What happens at 12 noon? They all go downstairs to the cafeteria and blacks sit with blacks, whites sit with whites, Hispanics sit with Hispanics. Are they racist? No, not necessarily. Uh, but they tend to self-segregate mm -hmm. because people tend to feel more comfortable around somebody who looks like them or shares their culture or speaks the same language. So that does not necessarily make them racist, all right? But you know, if you go a couple steps beyond that, where you think you're better than those people, then you're crossing that line and you get into a gray area. But what I say is this, everybody has something to offer, everybody has something to learn. So next time walk across the cafeteria and sit with someone who does not look like you, who does not share your culture or your religion and have lunch with them. Yeah. So you know what? I know a guy who's a white supremacist. He lives over there. Let's invite him to one of our Wednesday meetings. Oh, no, 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 we can't have him over here. He hates us. I don't want him in, in the same room with him. I don't even want to sit down at the same table. I don't even want to be in the same town as him. Well, that's the wrong approach. We need to invite that person to our meeting and give them a platform, allow them to express their views, okay? We don't have to believe their views, but give them a platform to express them. And if we agree with them, fine. If we don't agree with them, that's fine too. We challenge them. We say, look, I need a little more clarification as to why you think I should believe the way you do. Give me more explanation. And when you do things like that, there is an excellent chance that they will reciprocate and give you a platform. You make sure that you have done your homework so that you can present your platform in a factual, intelligent, and influential manner. Because at the end of the day, you each have to think about what the other person said. And if somebody says something to you that goes against you know, what you have believed from day one to however old you may be today, but you think, hmm, you know, she does have a point there. If someone is inundated with this ideology and they've had it from day one or however yeah. long, it's going to take a while, but you have to nurture that. You cannot shut them down. When you suppress that ideology or that speech, the free speech, it's going to fester and it's going to explode. You want to let it come out and hear it because how do you figure out how to address something unless you know what it is? Mm -hmm. So there's no skin off your back to listen to some lines of hate and this, that, and the other. You know who you are. You know, they can't define you. Just like Roger Kelly could not define me, he left the Klan. How many robes do you have? I have probably 44, 45 right now. 44 or 45? But about a little over 200 people have left different groups for which I've been the impetus for. Wow. I, have, I have other things besides robes. I have Klan belt buckles, swastika flags, and you know, different, different things. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I am struggling to remember a time this short where I've learned as much or valued as much as your time talking to us. This will not do it justice, but thank you. sincere thanks, sir. Thank you. Sincere thanks Appreciate for it. this opportunity, and there is much to think about and much to do here. So thank you for a lifetime of contribution well, thank you to, for the, giving world's, me the, opportunity to the world's toughest problems.